So, dear colleagues, today is the day of our Kharkiv Chemical Seminar, and our guest uh, for today's uh, lecture is Professor Tvan Lammers from <clears throat> Germany. He obtained his Doctor of Science in Radiation Oncology from Heidelberg University in 2008 and a PhD in Pharmaceutical Technology from Utrecht University in 2009. Uh, in the same year, he started the nanomedicine and theranostics group at uh, RWTH Aachen University. In 2014, he was promoted to full professor of medicine and Aachen University Clinic. His group aims to individualize and improve disease treatment by combining drug targeting and imaging. To this end, image-guided theranostic drug delivery system are being developed, as well as materials and methods to monitor tumor growth, inflammation, fibrosis, and metastasis. He has received multiple scholarships and awards, including ERC Starting uh, Consolidator and Proof on Concept Grants, the CRS Young Investigator Awards, the uh, Adlitev uh, International Award, the Belgian Society for Pharmaceutical Science International Award, and others. He currently serves as a president of the Control Release Society and is a council member of the European Society of Molecular Imaging. He is a member of editorial board of 10 journals and acts as associate editor for Journal of Control Release, Drug Delivery and uh, Translational Research, and molecular imaging and biology. Since 2019, he is included in the Clarivate Analytics list as highly cited researcher. And uh, dear Tuan, please, you can start your lecture. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me. Um, it's unfortunate we cannot do this in person because I think the interaction, also the level of engagement during the talk is always higher in person than on screen. Nonetheless, if there would be any questions on some of the slides, feel free to just shout and we can stop at that slide. It's probably more useful to do it during the talk than at the end of the lecture, but I'm going to leave that up to you whether you decide not to do, to do that or not. Um, my name is Van Lammers. I, I work at the University Clinic, uh, University Hospital of the University of Aachen, which you see here in the bottom. It's an interesting building. Uh, to some of the chemists among the audience, it might look like a chemical refinery or, or a big oil factory. It's actually a specific architectural design. It's so-called structural expressionism. It's um, it's similar architectural style as the Centre Pompidou, right? where you also have all the structure expressed. So it's on the outside of the building. So all the functionalities, the piping and the roofing and, and so on, it's all on the outside. We actually got a new institute a couple of, of years ago, which is called the Center for Biohybrid Medical Systems, in which we have a strong focus on combining disease diagnosis and therapy, particularly also imaging technology together with uh, nanoparticle formulations. And that is what the majority of my talk today will be about, coming from the context of cancer. So we're really interested to understand the process of cancer therapy, mostly drug therapy, and to see how we can use materials chemical materials, nanotechnology materials, bioengineered materials to exploit the pathophysiology of cancer and to try to improve the treatments that we have available in the clinic. So if we think about um, nanomedicine, many people think about drug delivery immediately, but nanotechnology is much more, right? Nanotechnology is defined or nanomedicine is defined as the application of nanotechnology in medicine. And that entails many diagnostic and therapeutic things at the nanoscale. So the nanoscale is submicron. Don't need to explain this in this audience, but this is the scale where we're talking about things going upwards of drug molecules. Drug molecules tend to be a little bit smaller than one nanometer, up to one nanometer. So one nanometer, you could say, is the size of a free drug molecule. And then that goes up until the level of viruses and bacteria, which are hundreds or 80 or a couple of hundreds of, of nanometers. So we're really within this scale of, of, of living matter in the body that influences molecular processes. Nanotechnology is more than just drug delivery, right? Nanotechnology also entails sensing. And some of the things that we've all seen that are very efficient um, in, in, in this regard, really highly efficient and, and, and to a certain extent also cheap materials that help us to serve acute 
diagnostic needs. For instance, deciding whether or, or evaluating whether somebody is infected with the SARS-CoV virus or not. The stripes that you see in these, um, in these lateral flow devices, those are actually gold nanoparticles that are surface functionalized with antigens or with, 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 with aptamers or antibodies that recept that, that, re, that uh, recognize antigens of the coronavirus. And if you're positive, you'd actually see those gold nanoparticles arresting at a specific site in the flow device, telling you whether you're positive for the disease or not. And depending on the size of the gold nanoparticles, which is typically around you know, five to 20 nanometers, these colors are different, right? They go from, from reddish to purplish to bluish. Um, but they're in the end all based on, on such biosensing technologies at the nanoscale. What we obviously use nanoparticles also for is for drug delivery applications. We can entrap drug molecules like chemotherapy agents, like anti-brain disease agents, like antigens for vaccination purposes. We can entrap them in nanoparticles, apply them in the body, and then the nanotechnology helps to more efficiently get the pharmacologically active agent to the pathological site, and at the same time, ideally prevents it from affecting other tissues that are healthy. Right? So you want to steer the drug more towards the site where it should actually unveil its action. A key example that we've all faced in, in the last years that clearly relates to nanomedicine that showcases how nanotechnology can help to efficiently treat diseases is the underlying lipid technology that is used for mRNA vaccines to fight COVID-19. So mRNA is the intermediate uh, between DNA, which is a genetic code of life, proteins are the functional units of life, mRNA is messenger RNA, and it contains the information that is used to express certain proteins. The spike protein of the coronavirus can be encoded in mRNA, right? And if you can then get that mRNA into the body, into the immune cells, you can train the immune cells to recognize everything that has that specific spike protein. However, mRNA cannot be used as a drug. Right? mRNA is very, very unstable. There are many RNases in the body. Those RNases are very active because many viruses, for instance, there are RNA viruses. So your body is actually evaluated a whole bunch, mounted a whole bunch of, of mechanisms to prevent RNA viruses from, from spreading in the body. RNases immediately cleave mRNA. It's really a matter of, of seconds to minutes and all the mRNA is degraded. And the second thing is mRNA is very inflammatory. It creates strong immune responses, not the immune responses we want to protect you against COVID infection, but the immune responses that result in, in local tissue irritation. If you would inject mRNA, the cells that immediately sense it, they would cause a strong local inflammatory reaction, actually thinking that that is a virus that is being injected. So to be able to use mRNA for therapeutic purposes, we have to put it in a nanoparticle that contains different types of lipids. Cholesterol is one of the lipids that is encoded or that is integrated. Pegylated lipids that help the material to not aggregate in these vials. And then there are other materials, ionizable lipids. I think they're one of the reasons why those particle technologies are so successful that help to encapsulate the mRNA that also help to release it once it's entered the cell, right? And without this nanotechnology, mRNA would not be able to be useful as a drug. So why do we use nanoparticles? Why do we need nanoparticles for drug delivery to tumors? Among the many reasons is that drugs in the body distribute very inefficiently. And this is regardless of whether you use a classical chemotherapeutic drug, or if you take a more novel tyrosine kinase inhibitor, those molecules are made to mechanistically interact with either with DNA or with certain receptors, with certain proteins in cells. They're not made to have a good biodistribution. Right? And that is why the majority of them, antibodies are the exception to this rule. Um, that is why the majority of them do not have a good biodistribution. And that's what you see in this image. So this is a patient with a disease called mesothelioma. This is a disease that is in the lung, in the thorax region of the patient. There are multiple metastatic tumor sites in this thorax region. And if you now take a drug, docetaxel, a very potent taxane drug, you label that with a carbon 11 radioisotope. And then you do PET imaging, positron emission tomography imaging. You can monitor in real time how the drug distributes in the body. Right? So this is during infusion. This is actually the needle or the infusion needle that, that goes into the patient's arm. And then via the heart, it spreads all over the body. 
And there are multiple things that you see in these images, right? So this is within the first hour, maximal intensity projections, PET images of where the drug is in the body. And one thing you clearly see, it's, it's not in tumors, right? There are no tumors here showing any drug uptake. That is important. That means that this drug only achieves very low concentrations at the pathological, at the target site. The other thing you see is it does not circulate long. So already within the first couple of minutes after injection, let's say between minute eight and minute 19, there is no heart signal anymore. You don't see all those blood vessels here anymore. That means the drug has left the vasculature. So whatever has not accumulated in the tumor by this time point, 10 minutes, it will never get there later on, right? Because it's already at other end stations. It's already in the liver to a very large extent. And in the liver, it is being degraded. It's being metabolized. That's what the liver is for. And then via the liver, it goes into the hepatobiliary clearance route. And then you already see within here, you already see the gastrointestinum of the patient lighting up. Right? And here you see it much more strongly. It's already on its way to be in the stool of a patient within a couple of hours after the drug was infused. Right, And another fraction you see here is in the bladder. So the drug does not reach the pathological site. That's an important problem that we have in cancer drug therapy. This is another example. This is a drug called doxorubicin. It's ruby, it's red. Its trade name is adriamycin. Doxorubicin is the most used anti-cancer drug globally. It's approved for more than 10 different types of cancer. It's very, very effective, um, but it has a couple of issues. One issue is like docetaxel, it has a very poor biodistribution, right? And that's what you see here. The concentration, these are tissue concentrations over time. This is mouse data, not, not human data. Concentrations in tumors, very low. Concentrations in many healthy tissues, very high. Much like this situation. Here you also see the peripheral nerve system. You see the spine of the patient. Right? Docestaxel's main side effect is neurotoxicity. That is because it accumulates in nerve tissues. Doxorubicin's main side effect is cardiomyopathy. That's damage to the beating heart muscle cells. That is because doxorubicin goes there. It's not specific for cardiac cells. It's just deposited in cardiac cells to a large amount, and that's why it causes its effects there. Um, the net outcome of this is that doxorubicin can only be given to patients six times. So even if a patient would be on track for a complete cancer cure, physicians would not be willing to give a seven dose because then we know based on evidence-based medicine that within the years that follow, there will be cardiovascular complications, right? Patients will get issues with, with their heart and that risk cannot be taken. And that's why doxorubicin treatment at that point needs to be stopped, right? And to solve these biodistributional issues, that is why we develop drug delivery systems. And those go from the lower nano to the micro scale, even cells can be used as drug delivery systems. With, with the overall goal, the aim of increasing the balance between drug efficacy and drug side effects by changing how the, the drug distributes within the body, right? Those th processes we refer to as pharmacokinetics. Pharmacokinetics are the distribution metabolism and elimination of IV administered agents. If it's a tablet, also the absorption phase, how it gets into the bloodstream plays a role that takes place in the intestine. And what delivery systems overall aim to do can be summarized in two main points, right? It, it's two different phases that they address with one being more ideal and the other one being much more easy to achieve. So what is the ideal scenario is that we entrap a drug within a drug delivery system. For instance, a liposome or a polymer micelle, we deliver the drug 10 times or hundred times more specifically to the tumor. And in the tumor, we then improve activity, right? That's, that's what we want, obviously. That's not so easy because cancer is very heterogeneous because not all tumors have a lot of blood vessels because many blood vessels in tumors are not perfused or not leaky, right? Those processes we'll, we'll discuss together later. Um, what is much easier to achieve is delivering a drug not to certain healthy organs. So if we put doxorubicin in a liposome, it will not go to the heart. That means this cardiomyopathy complication will not happen. That means that apart from much, delivering much more drug to the tumor, you can give it more than six times because it's not accumulating in the heart, because it's not causing any cardio side effects, right? The side effects are more in the peripheral tissues. So because it circulates very long, we'll see that in the next slide or so, doxorubicin liposomes eventually end up in the extremities, in the capillaries, in the hand and the feet. And if you then pressurize them, for instance, simply by walking, 
you end up releasing the drug from the liposomes in those pressure areas, and then you get local irritation, right? So doxorubicin is a chemotherapeutic poison. It damages DNA. That will also happen in healthy tissues if it is accumulating there and if it is being released there. But it's, I would say, much better for a patient and for a healthcare system if somebody has irritated foot soles or irritated hand palms than if somebody has cardiovascular complications, right? So we're always balancing the efficacy and the toxicity of drug therapies. One last point on this is that you have to consider that in the case of cancer, we would always take side effects for granted, right? Drugs are dosed in the majority of cancers up until a level, the so-called maximum tolerated dose, that is high enough to maximize the chances of having a good therapeutic response, while at the same time taking into account that there will be some side effects, right? Because if there will be no side effects, we can give a higher dose. So we're dosing to the level where there is a little bit of tolerable side effects, but still maximizing the chances for a good response. What we do with delivery systems is we're changing this situation, right? That's what I'm what I was saying. We want to increase how much goes to the tumor. We want to decrease how much goes to the liver or to the nerve system, or for instance, to the kidney. Also, in the case of platin, cisplatin drugs, they damage the kidney. There, we want to keep the drug out of the kidney. Nano comes from the Greek word nano. So, if you ask people what nano means, I'm not sure if that is different in the Ukraine, but the majority of people think it means very small, right? That's not true. It, it means nanos means dwarf. Right? Nanos is 10 to the minus 9th in this audience, and I don't need to say that. It is very small. It comes from the word dwarf. And if we put things in dimensions, if we put things in comparison, the way how nano relates to the body, this is my daughter multiple years ago, um, is the same as how our bodies relate to the globe. Right? This is 10 to the minus 7. This is a liposome, a lipid bilayer, kind of like a cell bilayer, a cell lipid bilayer that is 100 nanometers in diameter. And then we have an aqueous space on the inside in which you can load drug molecules. How this relates to people size-wise is the same as how people relate to the globe. This is 10 to the seventh meters. And kind of like how we put people in planes to fly them across the globe, we put drugs in nanoparticles to make them travel better in the body, more towards tumors, less towards healthy organs, to improve this balance between efficacy and toxicity. And obviously, planes have many advantages, right? Planes have pilots. Nanoparticles don't. Plates have GPS. Nanoparticles don't. Right? You could guide a nanoparticle with magnetics, but then you need to fight against physiological forces like flow. So we, we can do some certain levels of steering. In my very last slide, I'll give you one example on how we can use hypothermia to actually design, define where we release the drug. What is important here in, the, in this book from Asimov Fantastic Voice is actually a book based on a movie is that this miniaturized space shuttle that goes in the body to find disease cells and pathogens, they turn their lights on, right? So with imaging, we can actually understand much better where the disease is. We can see whether the nanoparticle makes it to the disease or not, right? If it doesn't make it, maybe we need to give it a, a, a higher dose. If it doesn't make it, maybe we treat the tumor first with hypothermia or radiotherapy so that then the drug therapy, be it a nanoparticle or be it something else, so that the drug therapy better makes it to the tumor. Right, so we can use diagnostic information a lot to improve the efficacy of targeted therapies. This is a busy slide. I'm not going to explain it. I just want you to, to take the points in green. What nanoparticles do as a general you know, take-home piece of information is they protect drug molecules from the body. They prevent the drugs from being excreted by the kidney, being degraded in the liver and the bloodstream. At the same time, they protect the body from the drug. So they prevent the drugs from going to sites where you do not want to have them like the heart or the kidney or the nerve system. We have many different types of systems. I'll talk about a couple of them during the remainder of the talk. Some of them are better for hydrophilic agents like liposomes because they have water or buffer on the inside. Some are better for hydrophobic agents like micelles. They typically have very hydrophilic polymeric blocks or lipidic blocks on the inside, which are good for things like docetaxel or paclitaxel. And then we also have different types of targeting. Right? We can target passively via the so-called EPR effect, to which I will come back in the next slide. We can also target with antibodies to have drugs go or delivery systems go more into the cancer cells. Many people think that if you add an antibody to a nanoparticle, you'll get more drug to the tumor. Right? That's, that's in many cases not the case. It's actually oftentimes the opposite because these things circulate less long. And the longer something circulates, the better it actually exploits that principle of passive targeting. And we can also do things like triggering. And that's the example in the last slide. You can preheat a tumor 
with hyperthermia, which we can deliver, for instance, with ultrasound. I'll show you some examples. And then once the nanoparticle senses that it's 39 or 40 degrees and not 37 degrees, the lipid bilayer changes and the drug locally leaks out. And all of those things are being explored at this moment in time already in very advanced stages of clinical research. EPR effect, I can talk 30 minutes about the EPR effect. I'll try to do it in one minute. It's been conceived by Hiroshi Maeda, 1986. Um, he was nominated for the Nobel Prize, I, I believe, multiple times because he described this process that was very important for kickstarting the use of nanoparticle formulations for cancer therapy. And what he what he predicted or what he showed to a certain extent is that tumors are leaky, that they are permeable, right? That blood vessels in tumors, because tumors are continuously inflamed, because the blood vessels are not properly differentiated, they have gaps or they're active in, in terms of transcytosis. And that means nanoparticles can leave the bloodstream in tumors, but not in healthy tissues, right? So that makes it more specific with regard to where you deliver to. And at the same time, his hypothesis was, they didn't have a lot of experimental data at the time, that there is no lymphatic drainage in the tumor, right? So on the inside of a tumor, if the blood vessels take it there, the drug leaks out, then the nanoparticle gets trapped here because there is no lymphatics to transport the nanoparticle out of the tumor. That is actually probably not correct. Right? It's probably much more depending on immune cells in the tumor, like macrophages that take up the nanoparticle, they retain the nanoparticles in the tumor and they actually also activate them. So the bilayer of a liposome is actually sort of degraded by, by the macrophage over time. And then the drug becomes available to the macrophage and to the surrounding cells. And then it kills the cells in the environment of the macrophage that has taken up the nanoparticle. To, op to optimally exploit this system, we need something that is long circulating, right? So we need many circulations, hours to days, to maximize the concentration that goes to tumors. The very first nano drug that was evaluated in patients is Doxil, doxorubicin liposomes with polyethylene glycol polymers on the surface of the liposomes to make them even longer circulating. This is Cassie Bagenholz, Alberto Cabizon. Those are the people that contributed to the development of Doxil. Um, they were the ones that reported many of the, of the early stage clinical studies in patients. This is among the first studies in which people compared, and this is work by Alberto Cabizon, where they compared in the same patient, free drug versus liposome drug, right? Doxorubicine. Free drug, half lifetime, five minutes. The moment you infuse it, it's out of the bloodstream. Right? It does not have any time in the circulation to accumulate in the tumor. If you put the drug in a liposome, the half-life time is in the order of days. Right, This is five minutes. This is two to three days. So we keep the drug in the circulation to eventually help it to go to these tumor sites. And what you see here on the left is imaging data from Kevin Harrington and colleagues who radio labeled liposomes. And then they monitored with scintigraphy. And nowadays, we would use PET or SPECT for these purposes. They label the liposomes and evaluate it how well they go to the tumors, right? This is the primary tumor of the patient, which is here. And you clearly see very strong liposome uptake. This is a metastasis in the foot of the patient, which shows very strong uptake. This is another metastasis, another metastasis. These are metastases. This is the liver, and this is the spleen. So the liver and the spleen are the organs that are responsible for clearing nanoparticles from the body. And they actually clear nanoparticles because nanoparticles end up there, kind of like we want them to end up in a tumor, right? Liver and spleen have a lot of blood vessels. They have an open vasculature, a leaky permeable vasculature, fenestrae or sinusoids in the liver and the spleen, it's, it's completely open. And then also they have macrophages for the retention component, the kupfer cells in the, in the liver and the radical macrophages in the spleen. So if we now take a patient or a disease like this disease, this is Kaposi sarcoma, if you then take a liposome drug and you compare it in a head-to-head -head phase three clinical trial, you take the new drug, doxorubicin liposomes, and you compare it to the best treatment we currently have in the clinic that was for k sarcoma adriamycin, which is doxorubicin in the free form, the trade name of doxorubicin, together with bleomycin, together with vincrisin, three chemotherapy agents combined versus just the liposome. And the liposome was two times as efficient. One complete response, 50% partial responses. Partial response means regression of tumor size by 30 to 99%, right? 100% is complete, but it's a very significant response. So really good responses for liposomes, much less responses 
for the three chemotherapies given together, right? Only 25% or so. At the same time, patients tolerated these treatments much better. Patients had less issues with cardiomyopathy, with, with heart damage, with nausea, with hair loss, which is also important for quality of life, and so on. So we're positively improving both the efficacy and the toxicity, right? So based on these principles, over the last 20 or so years, with Doxel being the front runner, many cancer nanomedicine have been approved for clinical use. So everything you see here is by the strictest of definitions, a nanomedicine treatment in the clinic. There are another 20 or so antibody drug conjugates, right? Something like 14, 15 that are approved, which would fall in the category of nanomedicine because they have a carrier component, a linker, and a drug, right? But they're mostly coming from the biotechnology field. And nanomedicine, at least the ones that you look at here, they mostly come from the chemistry field or from the material science field. So it's kind of strict here, but just to give you a flavor of what is included in clinical day-to-day -day practice, we have formulations like pegylated liposomes, non-pegylated liposomes. In some cases, you have polymer protein conjugates or polymer conjugates. Sometimes you use proteins as a carrier, right? Abraxane, it's a multi-billion euro or, or multi-billion multi dollar type of formulation that is used in many, many patients where albumin carries drugs in the body. And that is 125 nanometers in, in size dimension. We have inorganic nanoparticles, iron oxide nanoparticles and hafnium oxide nanoparticles that are injected into tumors. Their EPR and circ their circulation time in EPR is not good enough to exploit the EPR effect. So you have to give them into the tumor. And if you give them into the tumor, you can either excite them with magnetic fluid hypothermia to, to, to increase the temperature in tumors and kill them via heat effect, or you can induce radiation crossfire. So you, you amplify the efficacy of, of standard radiotherapy protocols. One of the formulations that I think really highlights what we can do with nanotechnology that we could not do without nanotechnology is a formulation called Vixios, which is a liposome that is used for leukemia treatment in which you capitalize synergistic drug effects. So synergism means that one effect plus one effect is more than two effects. So you basically your outcome is better than the effects of the drugs added, added on, on top of each other. And that is created if you always have a five to one ratio of cytarabin to donorubicin. And in the liposome, you would have 5,000 of one, 1,000 of the other. And if those liposomes, which are not pegylated, which will not go so much to macrophages, they will go to the cancer cells directly. In the case of leukemia, mostly in the bloodstream or in the bone marrow, you really deliver that synergistic ratio into those cancer cells. If you would give the drugs separately, right? Like, like the small molecule organic compound, at this five to one ratio, because of their very different pharmacokinetics and physical chemical behavior, they would spread in the body completely differently. So even if you give them five to one, they would never be five to one ratio in a tumor or in a tumor cell. And nanotechnology allows you to actually co-encapsulate them and deliver them to the site where you need them in that specific ratio. Up until here, everything is good, right? So, so far so great, so good. But there's also, I think, several levels of pushback. And, and there has been quite some criticism, partially because nanotechnology is, is in, in certain applications, it's quite oversold. But I think there are also fair arguments as the one made by Frank Zoka, who developed lip, lip, a liposomal form of amphotericin, uh, amphotericin drugs that are used for fungal infections. Um, he wrote a paper in which he claimed that there are so many papers out there, hundreds of thousands of nanoparticle cancer papers, but only 20 or so drug molecules, right? Where does that discrepancy come from? Where does the discrepancy come from that, that nanoparticles, I think, always claim very strong clinical implications without understanding what it needs to make a clinical drug molecule? It's much more than just something that works in a mouse. You need patents. Without a patent, you're not developing a drug. If you don't understand the heterogeneity of cancer or the specific problem of, let's say, brain tumor or pancreatic tumor, then the very best super nanoparticle, if it's you know an absolute magic bullet, it will not work because the problem is not addressed by putting a nanoparticle instead of a, a free drug molecule. If, for instance, there is no blood flow in a pancreatic tumor, even the best nanoparticle will not be able to work. Right? So we need to understand that we need to you know, not oversell and to really deliver upon the promise. We need to cross what we in translational development call the, the valley of death, in which products and ideas developed in academia 
by small, medium enterprises will need to cross this valley of death to actually go to clinicians, to go to patients, to really treat clinical problems. So we do this in different, in different regards. We work on patient stratification. We try to combine the drug molecules, also RNA molecules with small molecules. We do combination therapies, and we use nanoparticles to target specific immune cells. Um, immunomodulation is something that is very much on vogue now. It's also something that will definitely be coming in the years, in the years to come, also in the clinical arena. What we acutely need, I think, is tools for stratification. That is what novel anti-cancer drugs are already doing in the clinic nowadays. They're being developed with biomarkers. So you basically decide, decide based on information on receptor expression or on a genetic mutation, whether you give a drug or not. Right? And out of 100 patients, typically only 20 or so are included in a clinical trial. In nanomedicine, out of 100, we include 100 because we don't have tools to select the right patients to treat. Right? And that is what we need. And that is what I will be discussing with you first. Second half, I'm going to come back to, to combination therapies. So what you've seen also maybe in the literature is that people say this EPR effect and tumor targeting, it, it fails in the clinic, right? It does work in mice and in rats, but it does not work in humans. And tumor targeting cannot be proved in a clinic, right? This statement is not correct. So if you, if you look at these images, I showed you some of these images already. This one, this is a patient with a soft tissue sarcoma. This is where the disease is. This is the contralateral other hand, right? This is a tumor in the leg of a patient. This is a head and neck tumor. This is circulation through the heart, liver, and spleen. Clear tumor uptake. This is lung cancer. Clear tumor uptake, liver, spleen. So if we now look at, at 17 patients, this is very intuitive data. It's old, but it's very, very important. 17 patients with different diseases. If you use SPECT imaging, which is sensitive and quantitative, you see that 15 out of 17 patients are positive for liposome uptake. So it's, it's not correct to say that nanoparticle tumor targeting does not work in a clinic. The problem is here all the way on the right side. So if you quantify how much of the drug goes there per unit volume or per mass unit, there's an enormous variation. So some people only have 2% or 3% of the injected dose per kilogram tumor. It's not very likely that those patients will respond fantastically well. On the other side, if you have 46% or 32% or 53% of the injected dose in a tumor, that patient is much more likely to actually be responding to therapy, right? So we would have to come up with a way to identify these high levels of uptake and at least in the initial phases of clinical translation only include the patients where we feel that based on good tumor uptake, we can also expect good anti-tumor efficacy. And I'm going to give you one example of a company in the US and then a couple of own examples. I think this is one of the smartest ways to find patients that you want to treat. So what Merrimack and, and company Ramanatha and, and, and colleagues from Merrimack, what they did is they used an iron oxide nanoparticle, which is used for anemia treatment for low iron levels in patients with, with anemia and, and kidney disease. Then you use a nanoparticle form of iron. And this iron oxide nanoparticle also produces MRI contrast. So with magnetic resonance imaging, we can monitor if the nanoparticle goes somewhere in the body. And that's what Mary Mac did. They looked at many different patients with different types of cancer, and they quantified at 24 hours how much of the iron oxide nanoparticle goes to the tumor. And then they have a median, they have a cohort that is low uptake, and a cohort, uh, sorry, a cohort that is high uptake, high tumor concentration, and low tumor concentration. And what they then showed is that if you treat those patients with a liposome-based anti-cancer drug, so not with an iron oxide, right? That's only the companion diagnostic. If you take liposomal irinotecan, which Merrimack marketed, which is on the market now for the treatment of pancreatic cancer, what, what they could show is that for the patients that have good iron oxide nanoparticle uptake, on average, the tumor size decreases. That means patients are responding. For patients that are in the low nanoparticle uptake cohort, on average, tumor size keeps on growing. Tumor size keeps on increasing. Patients are not responding. And the heterogeneity is still very large here. But the point is that if in a clinical trial we could exclude these patients in a phase 2A, phase 2B, maybe even phase 3 study, that then the likelihood of the remaining patients, which are these, of, of them responding, is much higher. And that will make patients and clinicians very happy. It will, will make your investors very happy. And it will also make sure that your drug makes it to the next phases of, of clinical development. So this is how imaging can guide nanoparticle clinical translation. 
We worked a lot with, with polymers, different types of core cross-linked micelles, either physically cross-linked based on pi electron interactions or chemically cross-linked systems. This is work that, that has been commercialized by Crystal Therapeutics, Christiane Reiken in, in Maastricht, who came from the lab of, of Wim Henning in Utrecht, where we started collaborating already, I think, 15 years ago. We've done a lot of work on this together. And what, what actually the core technology is here is you have a polyethylene glycol hydrophilic shell of the micelle. Then you have a lactate modified HPMA as the interior. And if your temperature shock these micelles, they become hydrophobic in their HPMA lactate part. They self-assemble into micelles, and then we chemically cross-link the micelles. So we fix them by connecting the, let's say, 1,000 polymer chains that you have per micelle. And on the linker that we use to fix them, we have the drug molecule. And that drug molecule is connected via a linker that can be controlled with regard to release kinetics. So by playing with the different elements, we can control the size of these formulations, the release kinetics of the drug, and also the disintegration of the nanocarrier itself. What we showed with these mice cells, for instance, is that they target tumors very efficiently. We took a triple negative breast cancer model in mice, and we used a combination of CT, computer tomography, and optical imaging. And if you now look over time, initially, you also see the liver quite strongly, the heart here. But then gradually, we mostly see the tumor in those mice. right? And we get up to 20% of the injected dose in a tumor of a mouse. If we would do this with liposomes, we're in the order of 5 to 10%. Right, so these formulations, they circulate a little bit longer even than clinically used liposomes. And that is because they're 100% pegylated, where liposomes are typically only 5% pegylated. And that results in those mice cells. We showed that in a parallel paper in small with colleagues from Mainz, Food of Zentel and, and, and co-workers, that those mice cells do not form a protein corona. So in vivo, because of the, the dense pegylation of the mice cells, proteins do not really adhere to the mice cells. And that slows down the recognition of the micelles by the macrophages in the liver and the spleen. And then the longer you have them circulating, the higher you can drive them basically into the tumor versus into, for instance, liver tissue. What is important for that imaging biomarker setup is that if we image the micelles, the imaging information corresponds with therapeutic outcome. And for that, we made so-called teranostic micelles, combination of therapy and diagnosis. These micelles are co-loaded with paclitaxel as a drug molecule, size 7 as an optical tracer. And if you then look in mice after three weeks of teranostic treatment, so we always gave micelles that we can monitor and the drugs were inside. So over time, we build up high tumor concentration or low tumor concentration. And if you look now in green here in the back, you see the size of the tumors after three weeks of treatment. Where we have very high micelle accumulation, the tumors are very small, right? which is in line with the principle of Delivering the drug to the tumor results in very high anti-tumor activity. And vice versa, and from a clinical point, this is the most important. If we know that there is not a lot of micelle accumulating, then the drugs are not really working and the tumors keep on growing, right? And this would be the patients, if this would be a clinical trial, that you would want to exclude from a clinical trial. So with Wilhelmine Menke and colleagues in Amsterdam and Christiane in the lead here, uh, there was also work done on zirconium labeling of those micelles. Um, these were teranostic micelles, so they contain docetaxel, core cross-linked also with a chelator that can entrap zirconium. Zirconium is a long-living PET radioisotope, so we can image over multiple days. You can really see how you have a very long circulation time. Um, and with that long circulation time, you also enable these micelles to accumulate in tumor lesions in patients. So here you see a glucose PET image. Glucose is to find the tumors. Computer tomography, tomography is for the anatomical contrast. And here you then see how much of the micelle actually makes it into the tumor. This amount, total accumulation, I would say is intermediate. It's not very high. It's also not super low, but it's quite heterogeneous. So in this whole tumor mass here, only certain parts show micelle uptake. So this is probably a patient that we would want to exclude in a clinical trial setting. In the bottom, you have a patient with two metastases in the lung area. This is the heart. This is the spine. These are the metastases. And here we see higher uptake and more homogeneous uptake. So this is very, very likely a patient that you want to include. And if you now look at this busy table, please only look at patient number two, patient number three. Patient number two has 12 metastases. N is 12 here. Zero of those 12 metastases show any zirconium accumulation. Right, so this would be a patient that you definitely want to exclude in a clinical trial. Patient number three, endometrial cancer, two lung metastases, not the same patient as in 
previous slide. But also in this case, both lung metastases show good uptake. This is a patient that you definitely want to include in clinical trials. And this really shows how you can use imaging information as a means toward patient stratification. And if we would have such tool available, if we could identify those, let's say, 20 to 40, 50% of patients that, based on good nanoparticle uptake, are likely to respond to cancer nanotherapy, then the clinical translation of cancer nanomedicine would be much more efficient. And it would be much less criticism. So we really need to figure out how we can actually get this done in clinical settings. All right. In the last, I would say, 10-ish, 15 minutes or so, I would like to talk about combination therapies from the point of tumor priming. Why do we need tumor priming? Because tumor perfusion and tumor permeability and nanoparticle penetration in tumors are not as good as many people think. This is how we typically draw tumor targeting via the EPR effect or other mechanisms. But this is oversimplified, right? And it's, it's overly positive. This is how it looks realistically. So in tumors, not all blood vessels are perfused. Not all blood vessels are leaky. And even if liposomes leave the tumor, they do not penetrate, right? They just lie here because there is no convection, not a lot of diffusion that actually makes those liposomes swim through the tumor. So this is how this looks in real life. This is a blood vessel in a pancreatic lesion in a mouse where you see all of the liposomes fluorescently labeled. They did manage to accumulate. So this is a tumor accumulation of three to 4%, which in pancreatic mouse models is really not bad. But they're all lying just outside of the blood vessel. They're not getting into the tissue, maybe a couple, right? But the vast majority are not. And those are not seeing any cancer cells. Right? So how should they actually be used to treat cancer cells? So what can we do to change the situation? We can do hypothermia, radiotherapy. You can do pharmacological treatments. I will not talk about pharmacological treatments today, but you could also do, do this with drug molecules to enhance penetration. What we work on a lot is on the combination of micro bubbles together with ultrasound to actually enhance perfusion penetration, uh, perfusion permeability and penetration. So the principle here is that an ultrasonic field, which is a pressure wave, will influence a micro bubble, which is an air-filled or a gas-filled vesicle with a coating of lipids or polymers or proteins. If you have that micro bubble in an ultrasonic field, it will do what you see here on the right. right? The micro bubble will swell and it will shrink and it will swell and it will shrink in different dimensions. And if you do that within a blood vessel, you can either enhance perfusion in this direction. For instance, when a tumor has very many cancer cells and not a lot of vascular support, what happens is the cancer cells, they start compressing the blood vessel and there is no blood flowing, right? So you have a blood vessel, but there's no blood flowing, no drugs are arriving. The other thing what we can do is we can have that micro bubble grow to large sizes within the blood vessel to promote transcytosis or to open up tight junctions in blood vessels. And then we can really promote permeability, for instance, in case of brain delivery, where we have the blood-brain barrier. I'll show you some examples of this. I'm going to be very brief on this. There is a lot of detail in these images, but this, this shows that if we inject liposomes in mice, that's the signals you see here. If we treat the mice with ultrasound and microbubbles, we get much higher accumulation of liposomes in excised tumors as if we don't treat the mice with um, microbubbles and ultrasound. This is at the whole tumor level where we have an increase of you know, 50% to 100%, so a two-fold enhancement. If you look at the enhancement when it comes to penetration, it's many-fold. So this is how far liposomes, kind of like the image I showed you before, if we don't do any ultrasound and microbubble treatment, liposomes will lie very close to the blood vessel wall. They will not enter the tumor tissue, which is beyond these collagen fibers here. If we do apply ultrasound and bubbles for five to 10 minutes, we see how a lot of these liposomes, and if we quantify this with these concentric ring models, we see how a lot more liposomes actually make it into deep compartments far away from the vessel surface. And in particular tumor models like pancreatic cancer, which is very problematic when it comes to penetration, we see that if we don't do anything, 90% of the drug really lies here of the delivery system. So these are not seeing any cancer cells. And we need to shake up the tumor with ultrasound from the inside to actually enhance the delivery process. People in Norway have done, a, I think, a very, very cool and insightful study where they treated pancreatic cancer patients with inoperable disease. So there was a stage four pancreatic cancer that could not be removed by a surgery. And what they did is they applied ultrasound and microbubbles at the time when they were administering a drug molecule. And they used gemcitabine. Gemcitabine in those days was the only drug approved for pancreatic cancer. 
If you do not treat stage four pancreatic cancer, the median survival time is six months. If you add gemcitabine, it's nine months. If you have the best current day treatment, which is gemcitabine plus a nanoparticle, a Braxane, the one with the albumin and the paclitaxel, then you have 13 months median survival. If you take gemcitabine and you apply ultrasound and bubbles to enhance tumor perfusion permeability penetration, you can go to 18 months survival. So by using a clinically approved diagnostic protocol, right? This is nothing else than standard diagnostic ultrasound with bubbles. By the physical forces that that microbubble ultrasound treatment induces, you're able to get so much more gemcitabine into tumors that you double the survival time of the patients. And out of the, the 10 patients, there were two patients that had so much tumor shrinkage in the end that they could eventually be operated. Right? And those patients became longer term survivors because the tumor could eventually be completely removed. Then. Right? So it really shows how combining, smartly combining available technologies, building upon physiological knowledge we have, which is perfusion and penetration are compromised, using smart technologies and available and new technologies to overcome delivery issues. This is an example that, that was obtained by Fabian Kiesting here in the clinic in Aachen, where together with Anna Rix and others, he looked at perfusion in breast cancer patients. And going from power Doppler ultrasound, those are the images you see here, going from alt Doppler ultrasound perfusion imaging to microbubble ultrasound massaging of the blood vessels to enhance perfusion. What you see here is, is a large tumor of four centimeters or so in a patient which in the whole tumor mass, the black part here, there is not a single blood vessel that is perfused above the threshold of power Doppler detection. Then you start at minute two and minute four and minute six, you apply ultrasound together with microbubbles to promote the perfusion process. And you see how gradually you start opening the blood vessels for better perfusion. So now a drug or a delivery system or a CAR T cell or an antibody, now they can actually start entering the tumor and potentially having an effect there, right? How long this effect takes, we don't, we do not make you, uh, we do not yet know. And how often we would have to repeat this to really improve therapeutic outcome, we don't know. But what you can say for almost certain is that in this situation, drugs will not work because they're not getting there. The best drug delivery system will not work in this tumor because there is no blood flow, right? So we need to get that information and we need to do something with that information to actually make drugs and delivery systems work better. This is another example that I want to share with you, which, which is two different tumors in patients with a technology that we in-house refer to as, as ultrasound uh, microbubble tracking. Um, what we do here is we can follow individual microbubbles. And if you do that in a thyroid cancer, like here in the bottom, this is, this is a, a fluid-filled cyst. This is B9. This is a malignant cancer tumor. Right? So here there are a lot of blood vessels. Here, this whole black box here, or this block, this is a tumor in breast cancer. And the only part perfused here is what you see here in color coding. So maybe of this whole mass, only you know 8%, 5% of that volume mass has active perfusion. So how can anything work against the other 92%? Right. So we need to get that information and do something with that information. Here's an example from a cat. Cats get cancers. One of those is squamous cell carcinomas. If you use ultrasound to look at the perfusion of a tumor in a cat, what you see before we do this sonal permeation protocol, this protocol to enhance perfusion, what you see is, is, is in this video. So there are two different parts in these tumors, apparently, right? Without imaging, you don't know. There is one compartment that is very well perfused, right? So if you evaluate the perfusion here, it's, it's really very high, but here there's nothing. So if you treat with a chemotherapy or with a drug delivery system, this part will not respond. Then we do multiple cycles of sonal permeation, I think four to six. And then one hour later, if you look at perfusion, what you're actually seeing is that now a good portion of the blood vessels in that upper part that initially was not perfused is now being perfused. So now a drug can accumulate and a drug can have its effect. So we can also do this in, in a brain setting. In a brain, the idea is not to enhance perfusion in this direction, but to open the so-called blood-brain barrier, right? We want to open the endothelial cells to deliver drugs across the BBB. This is done with these helmet-based devices that are developed by Kulav Wohinin and other colleagues inside tech in Israel. They, they develop 
these helmet devices with up to 10,000 transducers that all focus the ultrasound energy in very small spots in the brain, one to three millimeters roughly in focal size. And if you then use micro bubbles, you can actually get material outside of the blood vessels in the brain. So this is without ultrasound and micro bubble treatment. And here you have a 10 nanometer or so dextrin. After three short cycles of micro bubble ultrasound treatment, now the dextrin is able to actually get out of the blood vessels into the brain tissue. And we did that for clinically relevant delivery systems. We first optimized the settings at which ultrasound, you know, amplitude, frequency, and so on did not have any side effects. Also, microball dosing optimized to have zero side effects in the brain of the mice. And if we then apply that and look at how much of a 10 nanometer polymer system or 100 nanometer liposome system gets across, we actually see that we get pretty good delivery still. Right? Obviously, the smaller it is, the better and the deeper it goes. But even a 100 nanometer size liposome manages to get out of the blood vessels if we pre-treat the brain with ultrasound and microbubbles, which is certainly not the case if we don't do anything um, for a hand. Right? So we can create a window temporally controlled and spatially controlled with technology like ultrasound and microbubbles to deliver drugs and delivery systems to the brain. Um, I want to end with a couple of advanced microbubble designs. I think this is, it will not be very chemical, but it has a chemical engineering component to it. So we can play with the design of the microbubble. We make those microbubbles of polybutyl cyanoacrylate. It's a surgical superglue. If you take a surfactant solution, you stir, you make a microbubble. In that microbubble, we can entrap drug molecules very efficiently. So this is the number of drug molecules per microbubble. So we can get up to 2 million individual molecules in one bubble. So that's really a lot. Then we can engineer the surface to be modified with antibodies or peptides. If you then inject those microbubbles, they will flow through a blood vessel. And because of the antibody, they can recognize a receptor on the blood vessel cell. Right? And if you then apply ultrasound, you have the, the microbubble on the endothelial cell, which means you're better shaking up the vessel wall. And you're also retaining it. And at the same time, you can release the drug that you have in there. Right? So this is how a microbubble looks. The shell thickness is somewhere between 50 and 150 nanometers. So it's actually quite thick. That's why you can also load so many drug molecules. And this is how that works in real life. So here you see in real time how those microbubbles are binding to the vasculature. Those microbubbles are very short circulating, like their half-life time is one minute or so. Um, if you do not target them to antibodies, you would not see anything in the tumor. All the green signal would disappear over time. But because they have the antibody anchor in each of those planes, each of these slices is 50 micrometers. Um, each of these 50 micrometers contain many, many microbubbles. And each of these microbubbles contain many, many drug molecules. So we can very locally trigger the release of molecules in those tumor sites. This is a microbubble if we don't apply ultrasound. So the microbubble with all the drugs inside, they just sit there. And if we do apply ultrasound, you see how the drug comes out and how the drug starts penetrating out of the blood vessels into the tumor tissues. We can also make those microbubbles non-spherical. This is kind of like a long project where we try to come up with a material setup in which we can stretch mechanically microbubbles to have a rod shape. And that is because if you take something that is non-spherical in blood flow in the presence of red blood cells, the location will be more towards the vascular wall. And that's where we want to cause the effects. Right? So what we did is we took these butyl cyanoacrylate um, monomers, stirred them in a triton containing solution. We have spherical bubbles. We heat them in a polyvinyl alcohol film above the glass transition temperature. We stretch them in one dimension, cool down again. And then we end up with non-spherical bubbles that retain their non-spherical shape. Right? That's what you see here. These are bubbles, not bacteria. They look kind of like similar. This is a fluorescence microscopy of a, of a model drug, of a fluorescent dye-loaded microbubble. If we put them in flow devices, we see that the rods are much more at the outside of the vascular structures as compared to the spheres, which are more in the middle. And at the same time, we get also a little bit of an advantage in terms of circulation time. So if we make them rod-shaped, macrophages in the spleen and in the liver cannot catch them that fast. And that means instead of like a two minute or so, or three minute half-life, we can go to four or five minutes. So that gives us more time to open up the blood-brain barrier. And it also makes the microbubbles move closer to the wall in the brain. And that's what you see here. So if you put 
the spherical bubbles versus the non-spherical bubbles, we can double the amount. This is a brain slice where we use a, a model drug, a red model drug to see where the BBB is opened. We did that only in this part of the brain, obviously. So the ultrasound energy is focused here. Only in that part of the brain, we double the amount of drug delivery by making the spheres or the, the, the micro bubbles non-spherical. And also here we can do targeting, right? So we can add antibodies against the transfer receptor on the surface of the bubbles that makes them bind to blood vessels. So all of these white dots are micro bubbles bound to blood vessels. And then what we can do is we can, we can create a schedule in which we can wait a little bit. And this allows us to be safer, right? This, this causes less off-target vessel opening. Because of their size, there's also more binding of the non-spherical bubbles. And here we get a difference of almost a fivefold, right? Only in this area versus only in this whole area here, if we use this non-spherical ones versus the spherical ones, we get four to five times higher delivery of the model drug molecule. This is done in the clinic. This is my second last slide. Um, this is an example in a patient, an antibody without sono treatment and an antibody with sono treatment in a metastasis of a breast cancer tumor in a patient. With ultrasound, we can also do a hypothermia. So we can heat tumors. We can heat them to 40 degrees. If you heat tumors to 40 degrees, you can use temperature sensitive liposomes. They circulate through the tumor mass. So you inject the liposomes, they will travel via the vascular system. They will eventually get into the tumor, then they will sense that it's not 37 degrees, but 39 or 40 degrees. The liposome bilayer in the tumor will rearrange. It will become a little bit liquefied. And because of the liquefaction, the drug molecules can actually leak out in those parts of the tumor where you heat it. And this is currently being explored for different types of cancer um, in, in the clinic. So with that, um, coming to the end, I, I'm involved in the Controlled Release Society. If any of you is interested and able to travel to Bologna this summer, please do consider. CRS is the largest drug delivery society worldwide. We'll have over, you know, worldwide, globally, with all the chapters, we have over 3,000 members. In Bologna, we'll hopefully have somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 people discussing many new things in drug delivery science, CRISPR-Cas gene editing, immunotherapies, artificial intelligence, and in drug design and delivery design. We'll have sessions for young scientists. We celebrate Journal of Control to Year, Journal of Control to at least 40 years. So if you're able, please do check the website and, and consider attending. With that, um, my four main points, and I'll just briefly read them out and then leave the rest of the time for discussion. Tumor targeting is heterogeneous. That's the biggest problem. But in cancer, everything is heterogeneous. So we need protocols based on imaging or other things to find out which patients we should be treating. We cannot treat all cancer patients. New oncology drugs never treat all cancer patients. Also in immunotherapy, you select for PDL1 or PD1 levels and a patient gets a therapy or not, right? In nanomedicine, we need to start doing that. Tumor perfusion is a limiting parameter. This is something that has been massively overlooked by 99 point something percent of people. So we need to start figuring out ways how we can prime tumors with physical things like ultrasound, but also pharmacologically or physiologically. And also keep in mind that with engaging the immune system, which we can do with nanoparticles, kind of like we do with the vaccines for COVID, we can help to make the overall outcome of cancer therapy better. With that, I'm giving the word back to the chairperson, and I'd be happy to take any questions if there would be any. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very interesting lecture. Uh, it's not a chemistry, but it's very interesting for us as well. Dear colleagues, please, do you have a question? To our lecture. Of course, we have a question. Yeah, please, Svetlana. May I ask questions? Thank you very much, Professor, for your very, very interesting report. In your report, we talk about mainly talk about the liposomal form of anti cancer drugs and some problems concerning for this drug delivery. My question is about inorganic nanoparticles. Do you think this inorganic nanoparticle uh, with, uh, for example, ROS uh, controlling ability, uh, reactive oxygen fission production or um, scavenging could be considered um, now as a prospective tool for anti cancer, for example, therapy? Do you know some result and what is your opinion about inorganic nanoparticles? 
I think they're very interesting. They're also yeah, so I, I think there, there are many different things you can do with inorganic nanoparticles. Um, Ross generation is a principle that, that I think in the literature, many people have been looking into this. Also things like ferroptosis or necroptosis or pyroptosis. They're all features that with an inorganic, particularly inorganic, but also with organic nanoparticles can be achieved. In the end, what I think holds potential is everything that is therapeutically so active that it outperforms what we have at this point in time. Whether causing reactive oxygen damage to a cancer cell is more beneficial or you know, more active, less toxic as compared to chemotherapy, as compared to tyrosine kinase inhibition, I think those things can potentially be compared head to head. And if you would show that an inorganic ROS producing nanoparticle outperforms the best clinical treatment that is now available for a certain type of cancer, then in a way you're always in business. Right? It doesn't, as, as long as you can guarantee that you can make the particle, some things are so complex that they cannot be upscaled beyond the lab scale. Right? So you always have also top down. Can it be produced at GMP? Can it be produced reproducibly in one kilogram scales? The more components you have, the more difficult that is. Um, from, a, from, a, from a pure physical, physiological point of view, Inorganic nanoparticles with raw generation can certainly be used for cancer therapy, but we need to find a niche in which that principle really adds value. It's kind of like with hafnium oxide nanoparticles, right? They, they, they form, I think, a too rapid corona, the particles that are now approved, to be long circulating. So what people are doing is they're locally injecting them into certain tumors. And because they're typically high Z atom materials, they 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 ex they um they increase the amount of electrons. They cause so-called electron showers. If you irradiate them, because of their physical features, they create much more radiation power locally as compared to a, you know, to, to, to a control, to non-injection. With organic molecules, I don't think that principle is possible. So there are people really engineered, they conceived and engineered an approach in which you get unique advantages of the physical properties of the inorganic nanoparticle, and they found a cancer in which there is still a need for injecting them into the tumor, applying radiotherapy afterwards, and then show that you have added value. So if you consider all those elements and the net outcome of that is positive, then you're really you know, on track towards developing a clinical product that will help patients. I hope that answered your question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maria, please. Hello, thank you very much for the very, very interesting lecture. Um, my question was um, uh, uh, about the principle of the bubbles. Is um, Maybe you have checked uh, that already. Um, does this bubble work by itself for other diseases uh, which are connected uh, with uh, blockage of tiny vessels like atherosclerosis for example when they uh, just mechanically uh, widen uh, tiny blocked vessels and let the blood flow very very good point yes is the answer um <clears throat> so maybe I, I i'm not sure if i said it but these micro bubbles are typically used as contrast agents right there are thousands of people every day that get micro bubble contrast agents to mm -hmm. look for stenosis for vessel narrowing among other things. Um, there have been publications already in the early 2000s, maybe already in the 1990s, where people combined micro bubbles together with tissue plasminogen activator, like TPA for, for occluded vessels in stroke, for instance. And it has been shown that micro bubble physical enhancement helps in reopening blood vessels. Mm -hmm. Right. To which extent that can be done in a pragmatic stroke setting, that's another story. Because what you want to do with a patient on stroke is you want to immediately treat, right? Like in 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 the in the ambulance car, while people are on the way to the to the hospital, they typically already get TPA once it's clear that they have a stroke. So if you want to wait until you're in a clinic where you can apply those types of of ultrasound together with bubbles, the thing is also you know that I, I didn't talk about downsides. The downside of that protocol is it's very local. 
That means that you can use it for primary tumors, but not so much for patients with many metastases because you don't know, you can't do all of those, right? It's, it's pragmatically not possible. In the case of a stenosis, if you would, or, or in a vessel occlusion, if you know where the occlusion is exactly, you could perfectly do this. But if you do it in a stroke case, like you're suggesting, you would first have to do imaging to find where the stroke is. And then you would have to go to a setting in which you apply ultrasound with bubbles. But it has been done. And I, I know there have been clinical trials. If you ask my honest opinion, I think it was probably it, it was probably more efficient than without ultrasound and bubbles, but too difficult to get it implemented in large scale. And that's probably why it's still not widely used. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you. Uh, by the way, which kind of ultrasonic uh, is used? It's a high frequency or low frequency ultrasonic? Depends. Yeah, so I, I think ultrasound, one of the, the cool or good things about ultrasound has many advantages, right? So also disadvantages is that you can use it in different modes and different settings. So if you use it at high intensity, what you can do is you can use it in these hyperthermia settings, right? You can do it in low intensity and then you do the heating to 39 degrees, 40 degrees, and then you... You excite those liposomes for drug release, but you can also do high intensity focused ultrasound and that causes then ablation, right? So you can do basically what you do with iron oxide nanoparticles and, and, and alternating magnetic fields. That type of hyperthermia can also done with just ultrasound, no bubbles, nothing, right? Ultrasound is like a microwave, it's just focused. So what, what I, I know people at Philips in the Netherlands did many years ago when the queen of the Netherlands at the time was visiting is they cooked the steak inside out. So they actually had a steak and they, they fried it on the inside up to 70, 80 degrees. And the same thing you can also do with high intensity ultrasound in cancer settings. And also that is being done in the clinic already. So there are examples where people with uterine fibroids, which are benign tumors, so they're not malignant, they're not cancer, but they are tumors. Those are being treated with non-invasive surgery. You basically fry away, you cook away with focused high-intensity ultrasound, you cook away those lesions. And there are many trials ongoing now where people want to try to do similar things for diseases like breast cancer or cutaneous cancers or pancreatic cancer and so on. Okay. Thank you. So, dear colleagues, do you have questions? I don't see. Um, what about um, real use of NADA medicine? Uh, for instance, uh, increasing of using NADA medicine in comparison with 10 years ago or 20 years ago. What do you mm -hmm. in real, yeah, so not in laboratory, but in, in, in real medicine? Oh, I, I think many applications. The, the fact is just that I, I think for me, you know, nano is not a goal. Nano is a size range or a technology enabler, kind of like imaging. Right? Many people develop nano to develop nano because that is what they can do at the nano scale. I can't do that. Right? I'm not a nanochemist. Um, there have been many formulations out there, like even Taxol that is used for Paclitaxel delivery. Right? That, that's in a way, it's, it's, a, it's a polycaster oil, um, which, which does form myself. Liposomes 30 years ago were just called liposomes. Right? And then people started, started calling them nanomedicine because nanomedicine became a popular field. And I think may maybe that is part of the, not overselling argument, but it's, it's part of the hype wave. And if you look at technology fields, all technology fields go with this hype cycle, right? So things go up in hype. That's when everything had to be nano. And then gradually it goes down and people like Frank Zoka and others, they were saying, you know, everything is nano overhyped. We need to think about you know, all the aspects it takes to develop a drug molecule. And now gradually you see how it's coming. Right? And I think one of the few good things of COVID is that it really propelled the use of the, the public awareness of what nanotechnology and medicine can do, right? At the diagnostic side, but also at the therapeutic side. So th there are hundreds of trials ongoing with nanomedicine. However, if you look at the prescription sheets in the vials that go with nanopharmaceuticals, I think maybe one or so out of the 50 to 100 formulations that are already used nowadays in the clinic, um, it, it doesn't really say nano. And it's also, it's not needed that it says nano. You can just say, you know, it's... It's, a, it's an iron oxide formulation for intravenous application. You could also say super paramagnetic iron oxide nanoparticle, right? The latter will probably sound dangerous to certain people. So if you just put iron oxide nano formulation, I think the public perception is probably the same, unless you're like a technology nerd, 
you would rather take an iron oxide formulation than a super paramagnetic iron oxide nanotube or something like that, right? So it's, I think it's, it's, it's eventually going towards a situation in which those things will become mainstream. That doesn't mean that all drugs will become nano drugs because it still needs to add value, right? But it, it doesn't have to be nano just to be nano. I think nano adds in the engineering process in, in enabling drug molecules or treatments to do something that without the nanotechnology element, it would not be able to do like synergistic co-delivery, for instance. So these things will definitely come. Okay, thanks. So I don't see a hand in my in my screen. Okay, thank you very much again for your time and for a very, very interesting lecture concerning such uh, perspective uh, direction of medicine as nanomedicine and uh, treatment of cancer. So uh, good luck for your science in the future. And Thank you. I hope we'll be able to meet in person at some point. Yeah, and as far uh, as I understand, now we have some some collaboration between our institution and you because uh, our uh, uh, PhD student, former PhD student, uh, Dimitro Bobziv, came to, to your laboratory as far as I understand, yes? Yeah, he's, he's, he's partially working in the lab now as a visiting student. We're trying to apply for a small grant, which is on antibodies and ultrasound therapy. So we're combining some of the work that he learned in Ukraine and then later on in Israel. So it would be a nice way to kind of use that opportunity to connect a little bit more in the future. Yes. So I'd be very happy to. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.